I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. Thaddeus McCotter, WJR, the great voice of the Great Lakes, is in my studio with me. Thaddeus, welcome to New York. Nice to be here. Thaddeus, uh, these last days, you and I have not corresponded, but we've watched the Clinton email story spill out incomprehensibly uh, to the American people. There's a poll tonight saying that the American people are confused. 51% of the American people believe it's a problem. 48% of the American people believe it's not a problem. However, 57% of the American people still believe that Mrs. Clinton will make a worthy president. This is about the emails. This is not about Mrs. Clinton, the presumptive nominee for the Democratic Party for the presidency, nor about her presidency. It's about the emails and the puzzle of the emails conjoined with another large story of these last years. That's September 11th, 2012, Benghazi. Mrs. Clinton, that evening, was made aware, as was the national security apparatus of the United States, that there was a catastrophe underway in Libya. Libya today has slipped into a failed state. It is overrun by al-Qaeda and its kindred of Cain, sometimes called Ansar al-Sharia. Ansar al-Sharia was the attack force on the residents and the CIA compound in Benghazi on September 11, 2012. But now the Islamic State has showed up and made a province of the Islamic State in Libya. So the whole country is now slipping under darkness visible. But in September 11, 2012, there was a moment that Libya was identified by the State Department as a possible turnaround, as a possible way to come back from the Gaddafi regime. Cyrenaica province and Benghazi, the large Syri uh, city in Cyrenaica, was a focus of Ambassador Stevens. That was something that was important to Mrs. Clinton at the State Department. It was important to the CIA. That's why the compound was there. Larry Johnson of No Quarter joins because Larry walked all of us through this week after week, month after month, back in 12, 13, and now we have the Trey Gowdy Committee investigating for the House of Representatives, the Benghazi, who knew what and when. But I come back to the emails. Larry, if I didn't know you better, I would think you made this up, but you're, you're, you have a better sense of humor than that, because this immediately looks concocted. How did Mrs. Clinton's responsibilities at the State Department run into Benghazi? by email. So I want to take you a particular exchange that night that we can presume happened between a man named Kennedy and Mrs. Clinton. Who was Kennedy and what would they have been exchanging about that we don't have a record of? Good evening, Larry. Good evening, John and, and Thad. Uh, listen, uh, Pat Kennedy was in charge of, uh, he's sort of the, 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 the secretary uh, of, of the, the seventh floor for Mrs. Clinton. And directly under him, he was what's called M, management. And directly under M uh, it was the Depart Diplomatic Security, the Bureau of Diplomatic Security. So that means any requests, any significant policy issues would filter up through Pat Kennedy and then be presented to uh, uh, Hillary Clinton. So both Pat Kennedy and Hillary Clinton knew that night that in the past they had rejected repeated requests for upgraded security in at both the embassy in Tripoli and the diplomatic facilities uh, that were not were readily acknowledged out in Benghazi. Why? From their standpoint, and this is tr typical in, in, in State Department uh, inside baseball, it was because they saw this as largely an intelligence operation and felt that the CIA should have been paying for it and that the State Department should not have been paying for it. But as this event began to unfold, they immediately realized the jeopardy that they were in and how bad this would look. And so um, what was so curious that night is there is a very established procedure this dates back to 1985 with the Achille Laurel incident of how interagency, each both notification in the department, notification within the interagency government community, alerting CIA, alerting NSA, alerting DOD, and the, the, the joint staff, as well as the Secretary of Defense, alerting the FBI, alerting the Department of Justice. This entire interagency process gets turned on on these kinds of circumstances. And this night, she shut it down because the people at State Department, a very senior uh, uh, officer by the name of Mark Thompson, who was the Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Counterterrorism Bureau, 
he was the, he was the, the operation center was directed not to contact Mark, not to alert him to this. Why? Because if they alerted him to it, it would have been acknowledging that there was a terrorist attack underway. And at that point in the campaign, Barack Obama had already asserted that Al Qaeda was on the run, Osama bin Laden was dead, and so there really was no more terrorism to be had. Larry, it's that is isn't the very complexity of the situation that you were discussing, that we're discussing here, kind of what the Clintons are banking upon. The American public and the numbers that John had put forward show they're not so much concerned about the emails procedurally unless something is revealed in them that Mrs. Clinton lied to them or had a damaging decision in terms of public policy that affected their lives. Well, no, I, I think that's correct. I mean, with, to, to understand this, people need more than a five-second attention span, and to get into it, uh, I think as they if they get if they get, if they get access to these emails, uh, what intrigues me is not so much the email exchanges that night; it is the email exchanges in the days prior to that that Hillary most likely, and I'm, I'll guarantee you, she had with Ambassador Stevens. Why? Because Ambassador Stevens was there carrying out a covert operation. He was a coordinator on the ground for both State Department and the White House. Now, normally those kinds of communications should be shared via a secure network, either, you know, what they call SIPRNet, which is the, the secret network, or they also have a top secret network. And in this case, uh, I'm sure communication was going back and forth. They didn't take time to classify it. Uh, that is what that's that's what they're covering up, because it would have illustrated that the United States was engaged in helping support an effort by the governments of Turkey and Saudi Arabia to get collect and pass weapons from uh, Libya that were making their way into the hands of Syrian rebels. Unfortunately, most of those weapons were winding up in the hands of Islamic radicals, and we've now seen the fruits of that effort as I. ISIS has proliferated, Al Nusra has continued with strength in the region. And, and that's that's what the you know Hillary Clinton and company are sitting on because they, they recognize the peril of that information. And those emails are what the Gowdy Committee is looking for, and so far what we have from them is they don't have it. They don't have any of her Mrs. Clinton's emails that night or the weeks before or the weeks after. Right. And, and also one of the other issues that would be, uh, come up that night was the decision to try to push the story to this videotape as the excuse or explanation for why this attack occurred. But, I, you know, I know firsthand that within hours of that attack as it was unfolding that they knew that it actually involved Islamic groups that had nothing to do with the video. Uh, more, moreover, I, I know that Mark Thompson made repeated efforts through Pat Kennedy to inform him, because Mark was, had been a Marine officer, he left the Marine Corps as a major after a good career, and he had been a mortar officer. So he knew when they received the reports that mortars were being fired that this was an organized attack. But more importantly than that, early on, they knew that Ambassador Stevens was missing. No one knew where he was. He was feared kidnapped. And again, this gets to the interagency process where you, you convene what is called a CIVITS, a secure video teleconference uh, with, uh, with the CAS, CSG, which is a counterterrorism, it's an interagency group of the counterterrorism professionals at the various agencies, who at that point begin outlining and preparing possible courses of action, identifying resources that would be needed, identifying decisions that should be made by the president in order to get resources into the field to begin the search for Ambassador Stevens. Larry, I want to stay with Kennedy and Clinton that need sure. It's From what you describe, it's not credible that there wouldn't have been an enormous amount of communication flowing back and forth, certainly with their permission or their knowledge. There had to be an apparatus, engaged or not engaged. It doesn't make sense that there'd be no record of that, does it, Larry? Uh, no, and in fact, what, what happened at the State Department was, again, with the computer revolution, back in my day in the early, in, in the early 90s, messages were sent via cables. And, you know, and there's a formalized process for how you prepare a cable, you circulate it, you get coordination on it. But in these kinds of circumstances where you've got a fast-moving event, quick information to share, the, the email and text 
it became a, a very convenient. Larry, stuff. can we believe that the emails Mrs. Clinton was sell- sending from one device, so she said it was convenience, and that that email used the server wherever it is, whether it's in Westchester or Manhattan or Washington, wherever that server is. Right. We have to believe that that email flowing through that server was speaking to all these facts, all these decisions. That's, yes. a, that's, a, that's a living record. That's a moving record of right. everything that happened that night and before and after that night. Right, and, but I think it's important to draw a distinction because this will be one of the things that will be cropping up as one of the Clintonisms for explaining this away. They didn't, uh, they'll be able to truthfully say, we did not pass information, classified information uh, that showed up on the SEPRANET because that has a specific classification. But if you have classified information and you're writing about it, but you're not attaching the classification label to it, you can get away with arguing that you weren't necessarily passing classified information. Well, that's not up for them to decide what's classified and what's not, well, Larry. That's the, what we're living with right now. The only vetting we know that it's been done on those emails is by Mrs. Clinton's staff. We don't know anything more than that. Uh, correct, but uh, I'm just simply saying the when you go onto the SIPRNET, you'll see everything with a secret banner on the headline. Right. The SIPRNET did not have connectivity to Hillary's black. Right. It was a separate operation. I understand. But, her but email, was, though, the only way to communicate with her was that BlackBerry that night. Right. And 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 so there was actually classified information being passed, but it was not being classified. All right. We'll stop there because I am now exhausted to the point. Thaddeus, <laughs> we'll never get it. We'll never absolutely get it. We've identified what we'll never get. It's it's a moment in history where America is going to have to deal with the fact the stone wall just came down. Oh, I don't know. You may have to wait a little bit, and there may be a roundabout way that it comes out. Because fundamentally, what you're hearing from Larry is that this administration, which cites Iran's opposition to ISIS as a reason for allowing them to get a nuclear weapon, is trying to avoid the fact that they may have been very complicit in arming ISIS in the first place. That is McCotter, WJR, the great voice of the Great Lakes. How did they get the arms? That's another story that Larry will tell. They started in Gaddafi's locker. Larry Johnson of No Quarter. I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show.